Hey, how you guys doing? It's Produced from Brothers Comics. Welcome to our House of the Dragons. That's right, S. House of the Dragons recap show as we go over season two of House of the Dragon uh, presented on Max. What is HBO, y'all? It's something <laughs> in the past. I have no idea. It was a thing and then it wasn't. Uh, yeah, so this is our recap episode of episode one from season two. Uh, we have the most of the crew of our small council here together, minus uh, Sir Big Hutchalot. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, it's uh, Grand Maester Beavis. What's going on, man? Hey, what's up? So, is, is cinema does Max now include Cinemax? Is there no more Cinemax, or what? What, what is yeah, even happening? It, yeah, it's just Max. Max is all encompassing now, it has taken over what was HBO. And there's a whole different podcast about how about ruining brand names that have such a meaning to it right we, we're looking at you x twitter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also the artist but, yeah. formerly known as exactly also on the line it's the person that's going to guide us through this through the books part as well as the visual parts it's the lady dragon so what's happening hello hello glad to be back after a two-year hiatus of yeah. on a podcast a two-year hiatus is fine. Uh, okay, look, so I said I was going to have a little preamble before we started the actual recap of the show. And I think, you know, if you listen to any of our other stuff, you know that Grand Maester Beavis and I kind of share a brain on a lot of things. And so I think I'll be speaking for him when I say this a little bit. So one of the reasons that I think Game of Thrones was so popular, you know, I, I've made the tagline before, you know, come for the boobs and the dragon, stay for the drama. <laughs> And as we went through that entire show, there was a little bit of a hangover from the series finale. And I, I don't think that's I don't think that's a stretch saying it for us that it, you know, it was so not good that anything that was going to come after it, however many years that it did start after three, four, whatever, was just going to be something. And then when they presented season one of House of the Dragons, it we both agreed that, you know, yes, take away the violence against women, take away like some of the gratuitous like stuff that was really unnecessary for the show. That's fine. Give us more dragons. That's great, too. But much like NASCAR, <laughs> UFC, uh, any other thing, like people like car crashes. And I think that's why that show is also popular, especially with the non, you know, the the extra crowd, you know, the people that don't watch wrestling every Wednesday night, the people that just stick in, you know, every once in a while to pop in to see what's happening. The ancillary fan that comes in to watch it gets attracted by that stuff. So when they gave us season one of House of the Dragon, they essentially took away all of that. Great. No violence against women. No, those types of things that that was necessary to begin with. But you also uh, took away the wait, violence. Hold, 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 well, hold not none. Okay, go ahead. Uh, correct me here. Like, the, there's the horrific birthing scene, like, yes. early on. Like, it's a complete subjugation of the role of the mother in this whole society, which is an extension of this whole thing. Right. So like, they just, they went, they, they was like, oh, yeah, we're not going to punch anybody in the face. But or rape them. Yeah. On camera. Right. But, yeah, we're going to continue to exploit the power dynamic and also take away your agency in regard to parenting. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 you correcting me is fine too. I think you. My overall point, though, is where I'm trying to go is that they took away some of the stuff that attracted a lot of the people to the show, and gave us season one, which, again, you can go back in the archives and listen to what we thought about it. It was, you know, it was I. That's A I I I G H T T T T. <laughs> There's it was a I in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. It was a hype. And so when there was the start of, hey, here comes, you know, season two, Lay Dragonstone, very excited about this. The rest of the people on Brothers Comics, meh. You know, you know, so, I mean, we're here so we don't get fined. Exactly. You know? And uh, so <laughs> we're going to jump into it. But like I said before we started recording, like I actually enjoyed this episode because, again, if you listen to us for a long time, I think there's a portion of us as being kind of older nerds and blurs. Hey man, everything ain't made for us no more. And that's okay too. And so you have to watch it with a different hat on. And that's kind of how season one was not the same because we had our Game of Thrones hats on. And then season two, at least with this episode, you know, change that hat to a different hat and try to enjoy it for what it is and not what we wanted it or thought it would be. All right, 
where would that where have I gone wrong in that dissertation, Brother Beta? Oh, uh, besides the violence parts of that part. So, one of my complaints about season one was that there were, you know, they were just there was a lot of callbacks in a way that I think kind of detracted from the show. I think even just opening with the same theme yeah. is problematic. Like, I think they could have done more to make it a show in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, this season, so, so episode one, like, I don't know. I don't want to crush anybody's <laughs> dreams. So All right. Maybe I should just stop talking. All right. Let's get into it then. All right. Here we go. All right. New opening title sequence, but the same music there as Brother mm. Beavis alluded to. Uh, so from reading online, it seems that they're telling the story of Queen Helena and her war against, you know, Team Black, which I would imagine is going to play out over the course of the season. So Lady Dragonstone, help us out here. The different tapestries of, mm -hmm. that they're sewing there. And she's constantly sewing when we see her in scenes. So it's kind of like a, a throwback, at least, you know, to the to the opening here. Yeah, so the character of Helena in the TV show, again, very much so different from the book, is what is referred to in Targaryen history as a dragon dreamer. So they essentially foresee prophecies of the future. Like the first mm -hmm. ever dragon dreamer was named Daenys, Dan and she predicted the doom of Valyria, which is where the Targaryens are from, which she told her dad. And that was the one time a Targaryen man listened to a wife or a daughter <laughs> or a woman in general. No. and moved his kids to Dragonstone, and then yeah. that's how you got the Targaryens in what would eventually become the Seven Kingdoms. It, it is, I never actually did think of it as a call to Helena, kind of like sewing the history of the Targaryen household. Because mm. it's not just necessarily her war on Team Black, it's kind of pivotal moments in the history of the, the Targaryen family leading up to Rhaenyra, which it's, it's kind of, I liked it a lot better than I did the intro last season, which was the intro last season was essentially just like, it's like, you know, it's like the things of like blood filling up, starting from Aegon the Conqueror all the way down to the bloodline. It was just like blood. And it was like, it was essentially just making a big ass family tree. Okay. But it kind of goes through, you see Rhaenyra on pulling a Daenerys on the Sea to Dragon Stone. You see Aegon on the Iron Throne. And then you just get a lot of callbacks to targaryen lore and targaryen history so it makes it a little bit better given it's called like house of the dragon and not the dance of dragons it kind of just i i definitely liked it more than i did the yeah season. it makes more sense spinning towards the end without you know spoiling it and i mean we're recording on wednesday the show was on sunday so i mean imagine if you're listening to this you've already watched the show all over twitter uh, so just, yeah just well what i'm saying is so is this story play out where she's going to eventually obviously become queen right helena and then she's I mean, going she to play is a, a role technically she's a queen consort she's egg on well, but does she play a role in this continued war mm -hmm. all right that's no. spoiler no. no okay technically okay. no all right that's yeah. fine i hate this actress like with a passion um I love she, is same. she couldn't act her she can't act white that's <laughs> that's that's how bad it is she's awful like i she can't emote anything but well, whatever so well, i don't I, know about what else she's yeah. in but isn't that kind of a character trait here yes again book helena show helena two completely different characters show helena is like you know i feel like she's never conscious she's always off in dreamy land but mm. again that those are the qualities of dragon dreamers they never fully seem like they're there she was in the bugs and shit season one right that was yeah. she was bug lady yeah, it's like when she's saying like spools of green, spools of black, weaving dragons of thread. It's it's just she essentially is there to foreshadow. Okay. All right. All right. Team green and team black happening, y'all. So we're going to break this down into both teams to start and then we'll kind of tie it together as we go through. Of course, we're starting with team black, by the way, you know, because it is, you know, a uh, Juneteenth, happy Juneteenth oh, to all those say it's celebrate. not February, but that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Juneteenth to all who celebrate. All right, so we begin in the north, y'all. We get a flyover. Is that Bran? Y'all think that's Bran flying that raven? That you know, <laughs> I should yeah. hope to God not. <laughs> Don't even mention that name here. <laughs> okay. I swore it was Jon Snow, and so did Lady Dragonstone as we we're watching this. And I was like, man, that voiceover sounded an awful lot like Jon. Uh, but it's not. It's Cregan Stark lecturing. I said I always these names are awful. Just Ceres, Dragon. You know, it's just Ceres. Just call him Jace at this point. 
okay, about duty, honor, and all that stuff about, you know, who goes to the wall. Okay, so I had this thought, Brother Beavis, like as they were going to, to determine who was lined up going to the wall where they picked the stone out of that, and if you got the black one, obviously, uh, that was bad. <laughs> um, besides that part, um, so when did it change, like going to the wall was like this honorable thing, whereas by the time we get to Game of Thrones, going to the wall was like getting picked for the hunger games like no well, i think Dang it was yo. i think it was even a mix in game of thrones because uh ned's John brother Walker, whose right? name i can't remember because Brandon. i've blocked that wait no yeah, that's a dead one yeah so oh. i've blocked that show out of my mind now because of what they did to <laughs> us but yeah no ned's ned's younger brother who wasn't going to be like lord of winterfell or anything like that once there were heirs he went to um he went to the wall so i don't know if it's a uh you know the, if the whole drawing straws or whatever but i think it's a mix of yeah they have a lot of conscripts out of prisons uh they have a lot of you know probably farmers who just can't make their way otherwise in the north mm -hmm. and then i think there are some noblemen who just legitimately end up there so and yeah. then like he said it in the voiceover it's like it's crooks people that whose fate would have been death that are sent to go and defend okay and you know we get the winter is coming bit and all of that and you know basically jace is there to remind him like you know of the oath that they had made you know to queen Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra i can't get all these right which which one is Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra, there you go queen Rhaenyra before or you know to, well to king viserys and then to queen Rhaenyra. and he does like hey we'll give you a bunch of old ass soldiers that's all we got and they're like hey great thanks for these old people and then the raven shows up and then this is when jace finds out that his brother has been uh eaten killed <laughs> uh what, what, what <laughs> I um, mean, swallowed it, yeah, swallowed, in yeah dragon acid yeah but also too it, this is and this is another problem that we had in season one the time jumps with the actors like you know when we last left our wayward duo you know this was, dude was kind of a little kid too now he got hair in his chin you know he's yeah, like got face in his voice Go ahead. Why why did Bro go to the north for two freaking months and then came back looking like book accurate Jon Snow? Yeah, I mean that's I, that. I mean again, that's, I'm not I think complaining. That's, I like the hair; he looks good. But like, why? Yeah, I, I just I that's like a because we got really confused in season one with all the time jumps too. And again, mm -hmm. I know this ain't because of a time jump; this is just because of production. But it was just like ah, you and know, some people of, age and some people don't. Different. No. Lord Crispin yeah. or whatever. He's yeah. No, yeah, him and here. Damon have been looking the same for 20 years at this point. Right. But so yeah, did so. they tease that there's some other part of this oath that there's some other thing that they offered later in the episode? But that's Okay, I, really I, I actually love that you brought this up. Thank you for giving me permission to yap. Okay, so Jace is actually in the North, I think, for probably about four months, technically, in the book. And him and Cregan become like best friends they become besties they are what daenerys and sansa should have been lovers in the nighttime <laughs> that is what that, at that the is, wall stays at the wall <laughs> <laughs> that's a common fan theory many people think that they were doing some stuff but mm -hmm. yeah so they create this thing which is essentially called uh what is it called like the pact of uh of ice and fire Mm -hmm. which is a callback to Aegon's dream and the obvious name of the original Game of Thrones series, mm -hmm. which essentially, as you, <laughs> yeah, if you don't even stop right now. And that's, what they're, that's what they're calling it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, you know, no, they, they, were, they were brothers. Like, it was like one of those oaths where like they cut their hands and like they bind it in blood and shit. Like, that's how, we, that's mm -hmm. how deep we talk in here. That was a portrait. Too. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, and then it's eventually sealed with Lord Craig, and I think is Jace technically in the book would be fourteen at this time, and Craigan's like in his twenties. So mm -hmm. do with that what you will. Mm -hmm. And he has like a five-year-old son. He's newly named the Lord of Winterfell. He's really young technically, and mm -hmm. he has like a five-year-old son, Jason's betrothed to Damon's one of Damon's twin daughters, Bela. And he essentially promises that their firstborn daughter will end up marrying and becoming the Lady of Winterfell. So mm -hmm. that okay. is also part of that. Okay. But yeah, that's a that's I, a big thing in the book, and they kind of gave it five minutes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I like that. I like that we started in the north because we didn't really see it. I don't think in season one. No, not maybe at all. been alluded to a little bit, but I don't think we actually saw it. 
So I, I was like, oh, okay, at least, you know, as you talked about before, Brother Beavis, that, you know, the callbacks or whatever, they can be, you know, a little bit overdone from time to time. But I thought this one actually a pretty decent one to fly over that, to be able to see the wall, you know, like mm-hmm. that. I, I thought that was actually kind of cool. All right. Moving ahead. Damon wants a war, y'all. And Renares needs a bath. Rainies. All right. So, Rainies, whatever. All right. So, when Rainies comes back, she's been supporting the blockade against Queen's Landing that has been set up, you know, after this had happened, even though everybody doesn't really fully <laughs> know what they're going to do because Queen Renera is, you know, missing in action at this particular time. But yes. So, she comes back. Damon's like, yo, let's go. Let's get back on that dragon. We're about to go to war. She's like, I'm tired uh, and I work with children. You know, like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going back out there. My dragon needs to eat. I need a bath. Like, like this is not happening. And she's like, well, you know, let's go ride with me. He's like, you can't give orders. You're not the king. You know, and Damon's upset yeah. because he doesn't know what to do because the queen's not around. She's like, she's shirking her duties as she's trying to, you know, find closure for her child mm-hmm. that was killed. And he, she explains that to him, but he's Damon. Like, he's just a dick, you know, so it doesn't really work for that. But, yeah, that's not going to happen. You can't tell me anything. You're not the king. And then also we see Corliss of uh, Valerian. Is he still in recovery? I forget where. Where is he? He's not in Dragonstone. He's someplace he's in else. Drif- he is in his Driftwood, estate, right? His Driftmark. But yeah. Driftmark. Okay. Yeah, so he's there. Uh, he meets a, a new black, another one, Happy June T. Uh, yeah, I think it's Sir Allen, and I think uh, he pulled his brother, like uh, Corliss's other brother. Is that what they said that he pulled his no. brother out, or he they pulled mentioned- Corliss out of the yeah, he- uh, wreckage? Yeah, so Corliss ended up getting his throat slit in the step zones, and he and and uh, Allen, I can't say his last name because mm. that's a huge spoiler, mm. is the one that pulls him from the wreckage and they name drop his brother adam so it's adam adam, okay. adam and alan did I say? yeah of whole i can say that yeah of whole who are two very very important uh people that you're going to meet this season uh the internet also said that there also could be some uh cregan and jace situations here with these fellas is that also true uh, I've never in my life seen that. Oh, oh, in okay. my three years of standing this fandom, I have never oh, seen okay. Adam right, and Alan. Say so there's there's a side conversation to be held about one of the reasons that this season one was hated so much was diversity. You know, again, people can't believe that blacks could exist in a show with fucking <laughs> flying dragons. You know, but it's also black dragon fine. Black people, <laughs> no. nah, son. Come on, son. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it, there is an issue with that with a certain fandom or whatever of the show that's just going to be that. And we're watching that play out with the Acolyte right now. We're watching it play out with the boys right now. Again, Like, it's just, you know, it's just a part of the sci-fi comic community that just hates the general diversity of anything that's not straight white males. Like, it, it, it just is. It's just becoming more amplified because everybody has a voice online and you can have an anonymous voice online and be as hateful and vile as you want to. And, you know, whereas we watched season one, we were like, uh, okay, I guess this is what they're doing right now, you know, but it's not like they didn't make Corliss a, a viable character on the show. The dude's a hell of an actor. I mean, you know, every scene that he's in, he freaking shoes it all to be damned. Like, I, you know, you just hating him because he's black. And so when he showed back up, I was like, oh, okay, I remember him. And then I remember how they killed his brother, which I didn't really care for. But you know, whatever. That was one of they they were they didn't shirk on the violence on that one, brother. That was one of the best <laughs> moments of the freaking season. Episode Not eight for his brother. For, for me. Oh. No Damon. Right. So yeah. But anyway. All right. So yeah, that that's that group here of Team Black. <laughs> and then the Queen. Why you gotta call him that? <laughs> June <team. laughs> All right. So and then the queen seeks closure, y'all. So the other last part of Team Black here is that, as alluded to by Queen Rainies, is that right? Not a queen, never but yes. This. Yeah, Princess Rainies. Uh, that, you know, this is what she's doing. She's trying to seek closure on this. She needs to find the remains of her son so she can have closure of this, what happened in this situation. You know, so she's flying her dragon all around. She winds up in, what is it? I think it says it in here. 
Uh, maybe I don't. It's in shipwreck. She's in, she's in shipwreck bay. Yeah. Yeah. And then she finds the remains of her son and the wing of the dragon, you know. And again, if you didn't see the end of episode one or episode, the last episode of season one, you know, uh, Amon's dragon was Vagar eats uh, Luke. No, not Luke. Jace. It is Luke. Right. It, is Luke. it is Luke. Damn it. Yeah, eats him and whatever. And he's, you know, this is what's going to ignite this war. You know, I thought as a counselor person, I was like, yeah, this is kind of true. You know, when you have people who have lost a a relative or, or something like that and, you know, hey, we can't find the body or whatever like that. It doesn't ever it doesn't ever give closure or it's very difficult for those people to get closure because you, you can't really you know, kind of move on that because, uh, you know, there isn't that last moment to be able to see that particular person. So I thought that was actually a pretty decent scene, you know, from a counselor perspective. Where you at, Brother Beavers? We're probably like 10, 15 minutes into not just our show, but this show. What were you thinking? Like, did, did, I guess they feel very com confident and have no desire to, like, catch the audience and, like, get them excited about season one like mm -hmm. or season two. Like, this... This was dragging. I was no pun intended. <laughs> I was checking the clock. I was like, "Come on!" Very, it was very kind of just oh, like yeah. it gives you callbacks, but it's it's so sad that it's just like you want to turn it off. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I just again, like I said in the preamble, I'm trying to watch it for what it is. You know, like is, this is just what we're getting right now, and you know, maybe there is this slow build or whatever. You know, I watched that episode like after the episode where they talk about the whole thing for like 10 minutes or the, like the actors, the creators, the writer, director, or whatever. And, you know, they said that this show was meant to be on a slow build by the mm -hmm. time we get to like the last 10 minutes or so, which is, you know, uh, obviously a pitiful part in the books and a major part, obviously was what's going to happen for the rest mm -hmm. of the season. But I, I mean, I thought it was all right. I mean, through, I just, I just think one. with game of Thrones, like there was, you know, there were no true heroes, what, but, it was all the people were interesting. Like I have yeah. no interest in any of these people. They're, and they're not all just, interchangeable, yeah. and I have no yeah. idea what their yeah. names are. Yeah, that, I, oh, and, that, yeah. And and they're all named all, the same damn thing. Right. Yeah, or variations of the same name. So it's very keep difficult to keep it yeah, together. But you're right. They had to hit like they had to hit story beats in Game of Thrones like so fast. Like it, it got too fast by the end because they were just trying to rush through it. Right. But like here, it feels like, well, we spent all the money on dragons again. Let's just yeah. uh, let's have long drawn scenes with. I, some I think a big part of it's the lack of investment you feel in the characters is because again you're based again George R. R. Martin provides a lot of source material, but what he doesn't provide is characterization when it comes to mm. Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood's mm. a history book, whereas yeah. with Game of Thrones you are reading about like in the A Song of Ice and Fire books you're reading about like twenty different characters. You're getting. It's told in third person. I don't think any of those books are told in first person. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think any of them are. But you get like it's a I forget what the word is, but they know all their thoughts. You know their feelings. You know their personalities. And you get to see them develop. So you just kind of get to pick that up from book, and then put it on a screen with a decent actor. With this, they're doing they're making characters right. alongside as making plot lines, and that doesn't necessarily always work well if you don't have the best people doing it i don't mean actors i mean writers because the writers well I, and i don't think there's anything wrong with the actors really at all in this particular show except the time jumps like you see what i'm saying like we got a chance to grow with those characters in game of thrones because they were the same person throughout the whole thing whereas here you know i mean this is you know several how many episodes actually have we have of this lady being the queen you know five Why? of the Five, yeah, six, five of the eleven. Yeah, she's only been in half of the episodes, you know, of that of the particular shows, and we haven't had a chance to grow with them because it's changed, you know, out, you know, on multiple occasions at this point. All right, moving on. All right, Team Green. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what they're doing here. All right, all <laughs> King. Uh, so time for the small council meeting. Aegon looks to bring his four-year-old child. What's this kid's name? Jaharis. No. Yeah, yeah, Jaharis. Yeah, you got one. Uh, okay. <laughs> Bingo. Uh, to the meeting against his wife slash sister's objections. You know, he's you know he's in his studies. He's doing his readings. You know, maybe he doesn't want to be king. You know, whatever. And, you know, obviously, Aegon, whose father didn't give two shits about him, you know, is trying to at least build that kind of bridge between him and his son. 
you know, that his father didn't build with him because he was all about his daughter, you know, so at least he's trying in that regard. And then meanwhile, Queen Allison, let's get busy ooh, 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 with Sir Kristen, you know, before the meeting. Ah, ageless. Yes. I mean, uh, look, by the time season one ended, he had had a wrestling term. He had real heat. Um, <laughs> like he like I was near the end of that season. Like I can't stand this dude. Like he had just gone from this honorable dude to a, a despicable person, you oh, know, in the course so of a few sense. episodes or whatever. But now with her husband dead, you know, the queen got needs, man. You I know? like how she's like, this can't happen again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yet. Yes. By the way, this is a family show at this point. You know, my seven, 17 year old is on here. Yeah, this is a family show. <laughs> So we'll keep it clean or whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's basically it. And so it's alluded to as we finally get to the small council meeting, you know, that uh, everybody knows that Aegon is not fit for this job. Uh, You know, he got it. He shouldn't have had it. He probably should have been killed before he got the job. Like, there's no kind of respect for him. And so he's being controlled by the hand. Otto is there. He's controlled. This is his third king, I guess they said. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even in a small council, because, you know, he's young. He's impulsive. <laughs> like, hey, let's burn all this shit down. Like, let's get Vagar. We're going to, like, get some freaking some Funyuns, man. Like, we're going to go do the whole thing. We're about and, to ride on these fools. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's so funny, because remember, at the end of season one, remember, he was drunk in whorehouses. They had to try to find him to get him back on the throne because he had no desire to have this particular job. And now he has it, you know, and there's another scene where he has to listen to the peons make their request. And like, look, man, uh, Otto's like, look, we need to pay these taxes. We got bills. Uh, we're not doing any of that stuff to help any of these people out. And he hates it. That's a theme in this show, right? Everybody in this king hates it, right? Yeah. Heavy is the heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? I yeah. don't. I don't even think there was anyone in Game of Thrones that enjoyed it. They just kind of enjoyed abusing the power that they had. They didn't yeah. particularly enjoy ruling. They enjoyed arguing with their peers and not about ruling the damn thing. Right. Well, but they also think about it. There's seven kingdoms or whatever. Everybody's got. If you think about it, everybody's got needs and wants everybody's not reasonable and trying to get things done and you have to again listen to this bs while also still being able to rule you know it's a very difficult proposition but you know i, I obviously i mean Aegon is not nearly ready or should be in this particular position his mother knows it as well you know we got to preach patience you know they just want to burn down the riverlands what's the importance of the riverlands so much because everybody wants to burn it down okay so you guys remember uh our least favorite stepmom, Caitlin Stark, <laughs> formerly known as Caitlin Tully. Yeah. So they control a lot of the, like the, the Tully household, the, their banner thing's a fish. So they control like a lot of the ability to invade. It's kind of like smack in the middle of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And if they get to this mystical, magical place that legitimately kills every single person that I've ever liked in these books, Mm. Uh, called Heron Hall, which was the seat of the Strongs, where of course Laris, who likes feet, killed his <laughs> <laughs> killed his uh, brother and father because that's what they do. Mm. Like Heron Hall is, it is a literal war castle. It is built to invade. That's where Aegon the Conqueror, the first King Aegon, went and then started invading the other seven kingdoms to get them to bend the knee to him and his sisters. That it is it is a very important place of battle. And you get Damon referencing it as well within this episode. Like they want Heron Hall. They know they need it mm. to win. So the Riverlands are there. They become very important. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah, I think the Riverlands were more important in Game of Thrones because it was it was between the north and the south, which is more the nature of the conflict. So okay. yeah. Well y'all mentioned Lord Laris, aka the foot doctor. Um yeah, and so he's in already in King Aegon's ear, like, you know, your father, you know, listened to these little people maybe a little too much. You're being controlled by the hand and, you know, kind of setting that doubt into his head already. And again, you're setting the doubt into somebody who's very, in, you know, <laughs> not smart, you know, could be influenced by a lot of different voices. 
And, you know, that's obviously going to play out over the course of the se- season. There was that thing. So we do get a uh, – like, who did he try to give the – tell him to give a horsey ride to? He was the uh, – yeah. the Sir Tywin player. Lannister. Yeah. So is that – that's not the Lannister we know, right? Or just one that has the same name years later? <laughs> No, I don't think he's of any actual importance. They're, they've been oh. 172 years yeah. before Game of Thrones. He's dead. Oh, okay. People in the Bible live 800 years. Fuck <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I'm You're lucky to get to 50 in Westeros. Fair. So, yeah. Lucky to get to six. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Otto meets with his daughter and also states, you know, like, hey, we are on the same page here. But she's like, stop undercutting me in front of my kids. Like they're not gonna listen to me if every time table full of men, which is very yeah, hypocritical of her, given she did that crap to Rhaenyra. Yeah, all the freaking time. And I also want to mention because we forgot you didn't put it on the thing. It's like she's in the small council trying to talk. And she's like, "Have my letters to Rhaenyra been answered?" And the dude just goes like, "An apology <sighs> for her dead son." Like, yeah, bitch. yeah, and I did. I did. It says Queen Alice and Freezer's faces too, and she still thinks there's some chance of peace with her letters to her former friend. They have yeah. gone unanswered. Yes. Uh, and, and also, like, what the heck? You going to send me a letter? <laughs> Your kid killed my kid? Your kid killed my kid, had his dragon eat him. But you think a letter is going to solve this problem, yeah. girl? And I, I just want to point out in the book, which, yeah, in the book, when the latter 10 minutes of the show end up happening, a big reason or a, like a cause effect thing or like why they happen is because Eamon gets back. Because again, in the show, they made it kind of an accident that Luke mm-hmm. died. In the book, it was incredibly intentional. Okay. And so like he gets back and I, I, I do, I, I have a bone to pick with the fact they didn't give us a scene of Eamon going to mom, to like Allison and being like, mom, I fucked up. I really yeah. did. I really would want to have seen one of those. Because the line in the book is just like, like Otto tells him like, he only took one of your eyes. How could you be so blind? And Allison's like horrified, like, oh crap, what's gonna happen now that they did this? Because Rhaenyra mm-hmm. was considering like peace and then they went and killed their kid and then that's why she goes to this war. Wow. But in the books, he goes, he goes and he tells them and they're all like, oh my God, no. And then he goes and he tells Aegon and he's like, hell yeah, bitch, and throws him a party. Wow. Let's see, you see what I'm saying? Again, my preamble. People would watch that show. <laughs> they would watch Fire and Blood verbatim. They would watch that. Like if you play, it's like a guy. It's something like Brother Beavers and I talk about sometimes about wrestling. Like nobody wants to really be a heel. Everybody's trying to be great. Like you really need to get booed. The only person that really wants to be a heel here is Sir Kristen. I mean, Amon a little bit, but even by doing that or not showing that particular scene that he intentionally did that to that kid, like that would have made him, you know, more of a heel. Uh, and, that's a heel. an inner- that yeah. is an internet complaint is that yeah. I feel like Game of Thrones, like even if you had some kind of like fascination with the characters, like I'm just going to use Cersei for an example, because did I hate her guts? Yes. But her, her character was so utterly captivating. Mm. Like she was clearly the villain here. Like there is no doubt that Cersei Lannister is one of the worst people ever. And like this show, I think I saw it on like a TikTok comment earlier today. It was like this show is not comfortable with letting there be a bad guy yeah mm-hmm. yeah I, I definitely agree with like that. everything like, is being chopped up to like miscommunication misunderstanding yeah. even what happens in the last 10 minutes it being a miscommunication in the book that was intentional they were, went in there with the intent purpose of doing what they did ordered right. and, by damon and again that's what i'm saying like the, you know even with amon who's supposed to be like this bad guy they've kind of made him a cool heel you're saying otto's a heel brother he was, but i mean He's a manipulator, more like Littlefinger, but I mean, mm. that's a heel too, but just like, I mean, there's not like this overtly evil person like Joffrey, right? you know, floating around somewhere like in any of these well, season plus one episode. Yeah, there's no one to purely hate. Right. All right. So I know it's kind of worked up in here. So Masseria is back. Uh, Damon's boo is back in the hair. She gets captured on one of the ships during the blockade. And she's brought to Damon, you know, and he reads her for filth, you know, like, what the hell? Like, you're supposed to be my, you know, side chick slash <laughs> information slash whore slash. I mean, I got a lot of slashes, girl. And she's basically like, you know, it was about money. You weren't giving me any money. 
they needed that money. They gave me money to find Aegon. I found him. I returned him to them. You know, he usurped the throne. That's better. That's it. And he just feels betrayed or by what she did. Now she's the white what? White wolf? White mouse? White worm? The white, white worm. worm. Oh, okay. Yes. Whatever. Or she's get... also known as affectionately as a uh, Lady Misery. Mm. Uh, I still can't understand what the fuck she's saying, <laughs> even with the captions on. No, like man, I ain't trying to be racist, but. That's book accurate, also. <laughs> like it just, it's noted in the book that nobody ever knows what the hell. Oh, uh, okay, is. so that's intentional. So then it's not racist. Perfect. <laughs> that's awful. Like, I don't know if I would be giving no, George R. No, R. Martin. That, it's not racist. Is that not, 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 is that not how it works? That don't work that way. Oh, no. George R. Martin, not racist. Nice. All right. So, return of the queen. Da, 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 da. All right. So she returns to Dragonstone after fi she finally finds her son's remains. Uh, she has a room, uh, reunion with her eldest son. He's like, and then I got 3,000 old men to come. And, you know, she doesn't talk. They just give it a hug. He gets the Jedi funeral, uh, you know, burning all of his stuff, you yeah, know. And then they, burn. Yeah. And then when they get to their small council meeting, you know, she walks in. She greets her husband, uncle. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know what? I think we should do this at Riverlands. You know what? I think, you know, blah, blah, blah. We should do all this. And then she just utters the words, I want Amon Targaryen. That's it. And it's the only words that she actually speaks in the entire episode, mm -hmm. which actually gives it power to it. And I thought that that was actually a, a kind of a cool scene there, you know, to kind of cap off her. That actress lady, unlike the other white blonde haired lady who can't act herself out of anything, this what Darcy, I think, is her last Emma name. Emma Darcy. Uh, yes, yeah, they. She's great. They, they, they okay, are non binary. Very good. Thank you. Uh, they are a really great actress. Uh, I thought they did a very good job. No, they are impeccable. I agree. Yes, and, and incredible. Like that line was delivered perfect. And here's what I thought you should end that episode. <laughs> right there it was at 39 yeah. minutes yeah yep, it would have been the perfect time to end it and then you go into episode two i didn't think about that but yeah that that probably would have been perfect it would have been the perfect ending to that you but it, no but then there would have been nothing in this episode yeah that's yeah, fair absolutely too. nothing if they if they the possibility of them doing that would have probably been if they did 10 episodes and uh what they probably would have done to fill the time was go over with jason yeah. craigan in the north I think in and particular, think since they great. don't get Aemon Targaryen, then that would have been probably a bad move. And that is also a misinterpretation of the book. Not misinterpretation. That is a change from the book. I can't say that or that's going to start an incel war on the internet. Mm. And it was uh, happen anyway. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so that's a different thing from the book. She never speaks any revenge on Aemon What? Soever, or at least it's not documented. Again, this is a history book being told by three very unreliable narrators. We have what happens, who dies, and the year that they die, mm -hmm. but we don't know like the internal stuff, the nitty gritty. So essentially, what happens is like Jace's. It kind of happens out of order too. So Jace is still in the north, I believe, when Blood and Cheese happens. Um, Damon is already flying somewhere to go kill some people at a place I'm not going to mention yet. And Luke is at Storm's End. Luke dies. Aemon comes back. Aegon throws his party for Aemon, being like, hell yeah, you killed our nephew. And then uh, Rhaenyra receives a letter from Damon from the aforementioned place. That you didn't mention. <laughs> and, then it, and then it just says, uh, a son for a son, Lucerys will be avenged. And he had already, Masaria wasn't with them. Masaria was still in King's Landing. So he reaches out to his bay and she arranges for what Blood to happen cheese. to right. happen. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> she had no say in Blood and Cheese whatsoever. Is and I did forget the name drop the thing. The title of the show is A Son for a Son, Son. Uh, so, all right. Here we go. All right. So it's Blood and Cheese. Now, I've been running this joke with my daughter pretty much since this ended it's like oh they're doing blood and cheese and you know i can't get the names of these people right so i'm like it's peanut butter and jelly it's tom <laughs> and jerry it's wallace and gromit you know like i mean it really doesn't matter you know Cookie, cookies and cream <laughs> yeah, cookies exactly. And cream. yeah exactly man it's captain and crunch so the last 10 minutes or so of this episode is basically going to be the story of blood and cheese now again 
watching the episode, reading some stuff online or whatever. Like this is clearly a very important story mm -hmm. or this bit is a very important story within the realm of these particular books or whatever. So what happens is Damon takes those words personally, like, oh, bet you want him? Bet I'm going to make that shit happen. And, uh, you know, he goes to, to uh, Maseri's, right? Maseria goes there, like, look, I need your contacts, you know, inside the Red Keep. You know, I know you know people. I'll give you your freedom if you let me, you know, tell me about that. He winds up going to King's Landing. He goes and finds some people who are letting him inside, you know, the hate, the high towers or whatever. And then he hires these two dudes, Blood and Cheese, to go in there. You know, I think what Cheese knows his way through the tunnels because he's the rat catcher. And the rats have been, you know, sprinkled throughout the episode, obviously foreshadowing a part of this. Yeah, you, you know, also and, get Helena doing the dragon dream thing where she she always like kind of says like these little like it's like she's always just kind of saying random shit. And then mm -hmm. later on in the episodes or later on in the season, you just see what she's saying. Like in episode eight, she kept saying like there's a beast beneath the boards. And then in episode nine, you have Rhaenys coming up with her dragon Maelise and not Dracarys and okay. those bitches. Oh, OK. And oh, okay. so with her, like you, it's in the one of the beginning of the episode where Aegon is looking for Jaehaerys. It's like she's like. She's like, I'm afraid. And he's like, what? He's like, don't be afraid. No one's going to attack. Vagar's here. And he's like, not of the dragons, of the rats. Mm. And it's a reference to those guys. So I think with the dreamer quality, it's like maybe she knows what was going to happen to her kids. Like, I don't, it, it's such a weird thing to do. And they do it kind of okay. It's, it's, just, right. it's a very weird kind of way to portray her because it's just like, what the hell is going on in your brain? So I know who Cheese is because he was the guy catching the rats. Who is Blood? Like, okay. is he just like a hired muscle? Yes and no. So in the books, Cheese is the rat catcher. They're they're both just kind of people Masaria knew in the books that would be able to go okay. in there and do it because they just want to get paid. In the show, however, Cheese is the rat catcher and Blood is... Um, a gold cloak. You see Damon approach at the gates, which, by the way, how did nobody know that this dude was approaching from the gates? I'm sorry, that war crime hoodie ain't fooling nobody. They should know. <laughs> like, and so he approaches him at the gates. So that's also a very pivotal part of things that are probably going to happen in either this season or the latter seasons of the show is the gold cloaks were founded, were, are they are kind of the accessory to the King's Guard. So they're kind of like the other level. It's like they have all the duties of the King's Guard, but essentially they can get married. Where the king's guard obviously can't, um, Sir Chris. Do other things though. Sir, Sir, no, they're not supposed to be doing that either. Mm -hmm. Sir Kristen, and uh, so Damon founded the gold cloaks. He oh. gave all of them those positions. So he approaches that gold cloak, and it's like, like he sees, like he recognizes Damon Targaryen. He has no loyalty to the High Towers, who gave him nothing. Yes. But Damon Targaryen gave him High Towers. a gold cloak. I believe one of the, I believe one of the, uh, quotes later on is like someone refers to a gold cloak as a turn cloak, as a traitor. Mm. And he's like, uh, Prince Damon gave us these cloaks and they're, bolt and they're gold, whichever way you turn them. Okay. So those, the gold cloaks are loyal to Damon. So that's how it is in the show. Uh, yeah. And so they're going through King's Landing and the Red Keep or whatever. They even go past King Aegon there with like his, his crew and they're just getting drunk or whatever. And again, like even he knows that he's uh <laughs> unfit for this position, you know, like what the hell does magnanimous mean? Uh, and you know, he's just you know, they're getting drunk and they literally walk past the king in full whatever, and it's like, eh, okay, let's just keep walking. And they go through this. Like it that part for me was just like, I guess, where's the security in the castle there, brother Beavis? Like, what shouldn't there be something? Is it late? It doesn't matter. Well, they uh, so the they they do show a scene earlier where they show the rat catchers moving about the castle. You know, pretty much people are expecting them to be there, so that's the cover, right? Mm -hmm. And they're taking this secret route that's so complicated, nobody's supposed to know. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> they've established the plausibility that this is the way to get in. So understood. All right, so that's where we go. Before we get to the end, all right, so. Sir Kristen and Amon are plotting their own war. You know, they understand that Otto is controlling the king and this idea of just doing this 
via piece is not going to work. So they've got, you know, their little freaking pogs out on their map and moving the pogs around the table to try to figure out, you know, okay, well, we're going to do this and move here, whatever. They get interrupted by Otto Hightower, who essentially tells his grandson, knock this shit off. You know, your impulses is essentially what got us into this to begin with, you know. But, I mean, you know, Amon, it, again, if they had done what Lady Dragonstone said and shown that he did that shit on purpose and he tried to celebrate about it, like, I think this would have made this scene and other scenes with him more interesting, you know, mm-hmm. whereas now, Brother Beavis, he's really, it, it's still kind of hard to not look at him as one-eyed, um, silent, J mute. <laughs> one-eyed I, Jay. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I mean, I think Eamon, I don't. Eamon is such is kind of such a weird character because you get in this scene, he's just like I think I think the fan theory is that like he came, despite knowing that it was an accident, he came back and to not take the whatever for it because he probably just didn't want to hear about the shit. He was just like, yeah, I did that shit. I did that on purpose. He probably just didn't admit to the fact that it was mm-hmm. an accident. I highly doubt that he did. That would probably that would save his character a bit more, but I doubt that he admitted that it was an accident. But I mean, you kind of get him being like, yeah, mom is, first of all, Sir Kristen switching up on his boo again. Mm. I just want to say that in this scene because, mm. oh my gosh, the Allison hatred. Yeah. Amen switching up on his mother. Well, but it's kind of hard to, to believe that he doesn't know that dude is tapping his mom, right? Like, it's such a, it's so... that seems a little off. So, but what Brother Beavis, you were going to say about Amon? Oh, he just is an awkward lad. He grew up weird. Yeah. <laughs> they bullied him for not having a dragon. He's just a poor boy. But now he's the he has the biggest dragon. So it's just like the dudes that got bullied in school and became cops. You know. <laughs> <laughs> take that out. Take that out on the, you know, on the smaller little people, uh, you know, as an act of revenge later in life. But anyway, different podcast. All right. So back to blood and cheese. So they begin their mission. They're all through the tunnels. They bring a dog for some reason, and then they kick and put the dog away. I didn't really understand that part. Do dog, part of the episode. Dogs chase rats. And I was like, "What's the cats, man? Like, why are dogs?" I took it as since so cheese was uh, was responsible for the lower portion of the Megar's tunnels or whatever. Mm. I took it that the dog was a portion of navigating that. That it knew the tunnels that it was used to. And oh, once they were going the beyond dog. where he was uh, accountable for, then they didn't need a dog anymore. Okay. Or yeah, well, they kicked the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't like that. That, that, was, that was the worst part of the episode, truly. The most brutal thing you would see. Well, that comes back to this part where it, the preamble, too. So, uh, yeah, they can't find Amon, though. They're all searching up and down, left and right. They can't find him. And then as their searching continues, they wind up in Queen Helena's suite while her kids are asleep. And, you know, blood or cheese blood is off somewhere and then when he comes back he sees cheese has her you know with the knife to her neck and it's like well since we can't find amon we you know we need a son for a son right you know maybe bring her the head of you know bring him the head of uh you know little what's this what's the little boys just aries j harris j harris whatever <laughs> it's a bad joke in there. it's a bad joke i'm not gonna make it so yeah, so he's like, she gets to this thing. He's like, look, you know, tell us which one it is. You know, like, which one? Because all these damn kids look exactly alike. Like, that's tell that's us which one that's it that's is. That's yeah. yeah, like, you know, it's like, oh, look for a cock or whatever. And then they put her in this Sophie's Choice situation where she has to make this decision. And, you know, she points to one. And they're thinking, no, it's wrong. You know, she's probably pointing to the girl. We're going to kill the girl. And then Blue Cheese is like, no, it's that one. And they go, and then off camera, you know, kill the baby. However, uh, you do hear it. You hear the well, yeah, you hear the chopping or whatever it with a knife. It's not like in the book; it was a sword, so it was a clean cut, easy in ten seconds. They kind of Anne Boleyn his ass, but uh, in this, they're doing it with a knife, so you hear the severing, which is well, that was bad. That was pretty awful. Well, well, again, I, I, again, my preamble. At no point in time I'd be like, hey, let's show the freaking cutting the heads off of little kids. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, at all. This is where you definitely should do something off camera or whatever. That part was fine. But 
It's like, oh, crap. And then it gets to the fan theories or whatever. You spin it forward knowing that, you know, maybe he doesn't want to be the king. What Lady Dragonstone's telling us about her future dreams or dragon dreaming or whatever. Like, maybe she just doesn't want that for her son. And a way to end this kid's bloodline or the, you know, the succession or whatever is if there's no son, then I'll have to keep doing this shit. You know, because I don't want to be, I don't really want to be involved with this any anyway with my brother husband so uh you know i I thought that was you know kind of a a, an interesting theory moving forward you know any thoughts on that brother uh so i i understand this was significantly different in the book but yeah i mean it's it was interesting i mean she's kind of weird and so what she she points at the daughter and they no she points at the son and they think she's lying but no she really did give him up right Yeah. yeah yeah And in the book, not to be that person, but I am that person. In the book, okay, so... Two sons. She has two kids. She has a whole other child that hasn't made an appearance in the show, which, according to showrunners, is going to make an appearance in the show. So I would like to ask the question, where the fuck is that kid? Mm. So um, in the book, I think the other question, or at least the internet speculation, is like, where the hell are the guards guarding the freaking queen? It's the the royal family, yeah. Well, yeah. I know where one of them is. Hi. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the theory was since she's on the same floor as Helena, the royals all occupy the same floor in, in Megor's Holdfast, or at least in the show they do, in the books it's different. Uh, so maybe she cleared the floor of all the cards so nobody knows what she would her Sir Crispin uh, would that's do. That's what I would I would take. That Crispin's yeah. on duty. And when Crispin's yeah. on duty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. that booty. <laughs> but in the book in the book it's very different in the book Alicent is actually involved in blood and cheese not in the way she's involved in this part but she's involved in it is they they kind of know like the whole like nighttime routine of the greens and Megor's hold fast so Alicent's go into her new room because she's been assigned new rooms that she is now the queen mother she is not the queen consort and Helena takes up her old rooms so she's walking back to her rooms la da 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 hating Rhaenyra and then blood and cheese grab her, hmm. they strangle her handmaiden, and then they gag her, and then she's stuck there. Hmm. And the nightly tradition of Helena was to bring all three of her children to go to go see their mom, <laughs> to see their hmm. grandmother. And so she's just walking there as she normally does with her kids, thinking whatever the hell goes on in her head. And she like opens the door and her mom's not there, and she's like, "Mom." And then Blood and Cheese show up. They grab the kids. She had a guard with her because they're not supposed to be going anywhere without a guard with them. Yeah, that's weird. They kill the guard. And then they start demanding. The She has the two sons. So how they're just like trying to, like, I think the show version of this was like, hey, point out which kid is the boy. The book mm. version of this is she has Maylor and Jaharis with her. It's a son for a son, eye for an eye, son for a son. Pick which one you want to die. So she doesn't want to choose. She said, they're like, pick one or we're killing all five of you in here. Alice, not all five of you. We're killing the girl and both the boys. Mm. She offers herself, but they're like, nope, we need a son. So she picks the younger one, Maylor, who's not in the show, to mm. die because he's younger, I guess, or because Jaharis was the heir. Maybe he wouldn't know what was happening. But uh, then one of the guys, I think it was Blood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it was Cheese. So it's like he like goes to Mailer and he's like, You hear that? Your mom wants you dead. Mm. And then they turn around and then they kill the older one because she picked the younger one. Wow. So that's how it is in the book. And then they leave. Okay. And they don't hurt anybody else. That's what it is in the book. And it, I mean, it is more brutal. People expected a lot more out of it, I think. But uh, again, I'm not here for the people that are being like, I wanted to see all the gore of a decapitated child. No, I mean, that's just again, that's again, that's that was never gonna float, even wouldn't have floated on the original show. You think that seek therapy, please. Yes. So as Queen Helena flees after her son is brutal is being killed, again, I don't I do I don't understand this idea of like, okay, yeah, we're gonna kill your kid. We're gonna let you run off scot free. Like that doesn't make any sense either. But that's a whole nother story. So 
she moves throughout the red keep and as you lady dragon was saying you know she just keeps going around around and around in the dark you know and it's doing the thing where you film behind the person which is actually kind of interesting only mm -hmm. cutting to see the face of her who is making it more like where the hell is she going to go like as a scene or as a filming part it makes it a little bit more dramatic and uh she winds up in queen allison's suite and she is uh mm, otherwise uh indisposed so I got Queen on the run versus the Queen getting some. So <laughs> well, she says they killed the boy or something like yes. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's freaking out, and I'm just like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's she's well, all traumatized. She got traumatized twice. Poor girl. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That. <laughs> that's a very interesting part of how you're going to deal with that next episode. Hope they don't pull an X-Men yeah, 97 and just don't deal with it until it's later. A, <laughs> yeah, it's the thing and what the because uh, just the show's taken over my like Instagram and whatever. It's like in, in episode two, it's apparently going to be a big thing that Aegon's going to be like, like going to Kristen, like where the hell were you? Mm. And he can't say I was fucking your mama. So yeah, it's going to become like a whole big thing that Kristen wasn't there. And there are no guards on this floor. That's what makes it weird. At this time, like the King's Guards expanded in Game of Thrones. Like I think there's a zillion of them. But mm. in the, this particular time, there would only be seven appointed King's Guard members. And he's the, he's the, what is it called? The commander of the what now? What is it? The, the, what's it called, uh, Brother Grand Maester? Because I don't remember what the hell it's called. So like, Chris is the leader of the what? <laughs> of the King's Guard, what is it? <laughs> Like, I don't, I don't know. know. Lord Commander, that card. Wait, no, that's the Night's Watch. I don't know. <laughs> but he's he's the big one. Like he's the one that's in charge. He's like the one supposed to be he's Allison's sworn shield. <laughs> he's the big cheese. He's right. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. So that, I mean that's episode one, y'all. Again, like I said before we started, I I, I enjoyed it for what it was. It was a little boring. I'm not gonna lie. I dealt with y'all in the group chat. Like first couple of times, I tried to. First time I watched it, the, when it premiered, I kind of fell asleep a little bit because it was late. Second time I watched it, I fell asleep because I was bored. The third time I watched it, when I had had a nap, I'm like, all right, let me focus on what I'm actually watching here. And then you know, I was able to get through it. And again, like I think just watching it, Brother Beavis, for what it is, like I, th I think. It, it helps me at least try to get through it, you know, and again, I'm not saying that it's, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread or anything, but it's also maybe not as terrible as we might think, but it, I understand that you might've been bored. Yeah. I mean, this is a case of like, I don't think it's bad. I just think it's boring. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It's populated by uninteresting characters. Yeah. I, I don't, again, I have a lot of beef with the way they did the characters in this show. Mostly because, I mean, I am kind of the person that's like, I watch the books, I'm the read the book, then watch the thing kind of individual. Like, and then I spot a change in it, and I'm just like, that's not how it was in the books. But sometimes creative measures can work in favor. And this, I don't think it did. Like, the character of Allison is truly one of the most, I don't want to say letdowns. I just, I, She's so she's such an iner an ardently cool character. You kind of get the Cinderella thing with her and Rhaenyra in the book. Like she is the wicked evil stepmother. She's also older than Rhaenyra. They're the same age in the show. She's a lot older than her in the book. They took the plot line of Lena Valarian, who was Vagar's writer before she died. She was married to Damon, probably one of the coolest characters that exists in that book. Gave her like two minutes of screen time in total, and they gave kind of like points plot points from her story. Mm -hmm. to Allison and just don't do anything with them. What definitely feels like from what you're saying is that since the book doesn't really have a lot of character development or whatever, just telling stories over different yeah, parts and they yeah. can, but I think that's, that gives them the writers or whatever, you know, all this leeway to be, you know, adding and subtracting things from particular characters. To I think if D&D told the us anything, they don't know how to do that. Yet. But, I mean, I think, I mean, again, we're into episode one Preach of on, Lady season Dragon, two. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> episode one, I can't believe I'm the one defending this shit. Episode <laughs> one of season two, you know, let's and let's keep it 100 or whatever. Game of Thrones season one yeah. was a slog. For a good portion of it, like it was, it, uh, it was a little bit of a slog. It picked up near the end, and then you were completely hooked, obviously, by the finale. 
and then episodes building upon that or from that i think helped out but like the first part of season one of game of thrones it was a little bit for me it was a little bit rough to get through now i'm not saying that it was less than or greater than this or whatever but i just remember like oh man you gotta watch game of thrones but y'all motherfuckers was on season like five <laughs> <laughs> they were dragging. Like, oh, let me start from the first one like what the fuck is this yeah because it starts off with like the weird zombies in the snow yeah it's just like, like right meeting there. people and then yeah. you have the big reveal at the end yes yeah, so yeah. i'm like yeah like what's happening here y'all y'all what show is y'all talking about you know mm. but again as it goes on obviously it gets better now this ain't got eight seasons in it not for a damn it, it's be lucky if it gets, yeah it'll be lucky if it gets that far but i'm just saying like it i'm, I'm willing to give Four it more seasons a yeah i'm willing, to give, it, yeah, I'm mean, willing to give it more of a chance than i was the After producers season. and the George R. R. Martin and all of them have said George R. R. Martin said it needs four story four seasons to tell the dance of the dragons uh, correctly. Right what? <laughs> Finish the dance. Quit talking about. <laughs> yeah. Quit talking about. <laughs> Get off of the go press right and go right yeah. down. But it's yeah. supposed to have, I think, about four seasons. I don't think it's been renewed for a third yet. So that's going to be a. We'll see. Like it got renewed for a second season after the first episode premiered last time, but it, that well, hasn't happened yet. And then more off the side for you and. Brother Beavis and I, I'm a little bit knowing nor so, you know, all the change ups is at WB and all the things that are happening, their cost cutting measures or whatever. You really got to wonder how, because this obviously is expensive to make because of the dragons. And you got to wonder if it has, you know, that, you know, they got Tony Khan money to pay, Brother Beavis. You know, I don't know if they got money for dragons. They got what I would expect is they might, they might do a, um, after season two, renew to to produce to make season three and four at one time, and then and try and tear the sets up. down. That yeah. might be the way. Three and four back to back, yeah. right? Then they yeah, then but... they did that for what seven and eight for. Yes, they did the they last two seasons for uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah, but from what so, I, the producers are saying, it constantly is like this is again, the Fire and Blood book that is a history book, and the adaptation of this from book to screen. I was telling this to the producer. I think I, the day after we watched episode, season two, episode one was like House of the Dragon is the equivalent of like the other Boleyn girl to like actual Tudor history. It is essentially mm -hmm. historical fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a, you have the who dies and how they died and how why they died. But, well, not necessarily why they died. You have the years and all that. But the kind of everything else you have to they're figuring out on their own. So it is literally just historical fiction. And again, I bet that was probably one of the things that attracted them to this particular story is yeah. that, yeah, you you have the creative creativity there. And then you also have what comes after it as a as a as a template to make the sure attraction to the story involved. was they were like, we can milk this shit. We can make some more money. I mean, there's a reason they picked this. I mean, the Fire and Blood book covers from the conquest to, I think, 70 years before Everybody. Danny? Yeah. Like, there's a pretty... reason they picked to focus on Rhaenyra, and the reason they did that was to be able to draw parallels to the person who made the house Targaryen as iconic as it did, which is Amelia Clark's portrayal of Daenerys. They're just going to milk those parallels for as much as they can. And Preach on, Lady Dragonstone. It's, they're, they're going to... Oh my god, I sound like you, and I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they're going to milk it as much as they can like out of all of the stories you could have told like they could have done money, something money, money. about like i honestly thought when they announced they were doing like a prequel i genuinely thought they were gonna do like how robert baratheon became king that would that is I something would, that, that everybody would be, i would love wants. to see that yeah right like, yeah that. You, you still get the targaryen element you just don't get the dragons because they yeah no die. that's what they think people want so all right and or they could have started from the like they they're literally like Lot in the middle of Targaryen history. They could have started at the beginning with the conquest. Mm. They could have started there and they didn't. They chose to do this to have a female centric character fighting for her rightful throne mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. a bunch of men. And she has dragons because it's similar in a lot of ways to what Daenerys did. And they're kind of fumbling it just like they did with her. All right. Well, we will be back for season two, episode two, at some point in time. 
I mean, I think we're at, a, you know, again, it's the summer. It's the perfect time for this particular series or whatever. You know, it's able to gather the Avengers here. It's not like we're like, oh, my God, you know, we got to really get this episode out because we're so into it or whatever. Like, no, we're, we're, we're just plotting for <laughs> It's the summer. I think, it, I think it'll you know? get better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, I, yeah, I enjoyed it. For, I enjoyed it for what it was. So, all right. So, we're going to wrap up. If you're on the podcast side, you'll start to hear the Game of Thrones music play out on the outro. If you're on YouTube, you'll see the credits start to roll up here. Uh, so, some rate, review, and subscribe, and all that. So, as the producer, I'm going to sign off. Go ahead and sign off. Uh, let's see. Grandmaster Beavis, because we're just long for the ride, honestly. I mean, this is these are the best podcasts for me where I can just turn it over to people to talk. I'm just here so I don't get fined. Mm-hmm. Perfectly. That's understandable. Lady Dragonstone, close us out. Sayonara. You'll, you'll learn to love it. Because <laughs> it's the best going <laughs> today. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. <laughs> the, beatings the, the beatings will commence if you don't. The beatings will commence if you don't. All right. Yeah, I have a knife under my pillow. Nice. We'll see you after week two, everybody. Peace. Bye.